I don't know about you, but I find that life is hard. We have expectations for how our life will go and how we think this world should be, but they often go unmet. And we live in the shadows of disappointment and even despair. We long for real relationships where we can be loved for who we are, but instead we only find those kinds of relationships in the movies. And often we simply feel alone, misunderstood, and even unloved. We want to believe there is meaning and purpose to life because we believe that will complete something in us or take away an internal dissatisfaction. But it seems no matter what we accomplish or how much money we make or how many new jobs we try, it's never enough. We want to ground ourselves in truth, but competing truth claims veiled in language like this is my truth lend to instability and confusion. And we begin to question, what is the truth? And for many of us, this very real dilemma, which is part of our life, tends to cloud our life. We struggle with despair, hopelessness, even confusion. If you are feeling this way or know someone who is, I want you to know you're in the right place this year. Because yes, Life is hard. It is. But there's an answer. And the gospel according to John reveals Jesus as the answer. You see, it reveals Jesus as the way to the truth and abundant life. In fact, John writes this entire book with one aim in mind, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. And the beauty of this book is it tells the story of the truth who came in the person of Jesus to reveal the way to abundant life. Because the longing for abundant life that we all have is God given and God supplied. So this year, I want to invite you on a discovery. 21 chapters of John, over 30 weeks of study. And whether Jesus is new to you or has been a part of your life for as long as you can remember, he is the way to the truth and the abundant life that you and I long for. And John really wants you to believe that, not just a verbal expression or agreement, but to respond in faith because you believe. And so John builds a case grounded and interconnected to the whole of the Bible for you and for me. You see, he isn't just a guy who woke up one day and decided to write a book about a man named Jesus. John ties the words and the works of Jesus to the whole context of the Bible. In Bible Study Fellowship, we believe that the 66 books of the Holy Scripture as originally given, are in their entirety the Word of God, verbally inspired and wholly without error in all they declare, and therefore are the supreme and final authority of faith and life. Because we believe the 66 books come together to make one book, we would expect there to be a cohesive and consistent story through the 66 books. And when you understand that the authorship, the human authorship of the Bible is from 40 different authors who didn't speak the same language, live in the same place, or even know each other because it was written over 1400 years, then you realize that it is consistent and without error in all it declares. That's when you step back and realize it's not like any other book we have. The Bible describes the authorship in this way. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Bible starts with a perfect relationship between God and man, the life we long for. That's where the Bible starts. But man rebels against God 
And the consequences of rebellion are separation from God and a broken world in which we now live. And even in the midst of the brokenness and consequences, there is hope that one will come to redeem relationships and restore all that is broken. He's called the Messiah. And we have clues about his identity progressively revealed throughout the Old Testament. John claims that Jesus is the Messiah and does that by testing and comparing those claims to all of the rest of scripture. If John were to present a new idea or different claim about the Messiah, those claims would be easily exposed when they're compared to the whole of scripture. John's claims were wholly consistent. Consider this as we study the book of John. John reveals Jesus as the way to the truth and abundant life. We'll look at this in three divisions. First, in Jesus's own words. Second, through Jesus's works. And third, through witnesses' testimony. So open your Bibles to the book of John, and let's start with Jesus in his own words. Who does he claim to be? Now, John writes in a way to draw our attention to seven specific statements that Jesus will make about himself, which all start with the phrase, I am, which immediately connects Jesus's statements to the Old Testament and to Moses, as God revealed himself by the name, I am who I am. As a Jewish man, Jesus knew that by using the name I am and the words I am, he was making a claim to be equal with God. Now, the first of the I am statements, I am the bread of life. John chapter 6, verse 35, whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The context God sent bread from heaven to the Jews when they wandered in the desert so they would not grow hungry. In the time of Israel, they ate manna and they still died. Jesus is saying he is the bread God is sending now. The bread was his flesh that he would give for the life of the world so that people could eat from him and never die. Jesus says he's a superior bread from God as the bread of life because he is the source and sustainer of life in a way that food will never be. Then he says, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light is necessary for life. The opening words of John will identify Jesus as the life that gave light to all mankind. Jesus as the light is the source and supplier of life. There's no abundant life without light. Then he says, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved in John chapter 10, verse 7. He is the way. Gates keep people in or out. And Jesus says, I'm the way for people to be saved. His next statement, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 10, verse 11. There is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy but Jesus is the good shepherd. You may be familiar with the 23rd Psalm in the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus says, I am the one who protects the sheep, who lays down his life for the sheep, who ensures the safety of the sheep. That should resonate with his audience because all throughout scripture, the Lord's people are likened to sheep and their leaders are charged to be shepherds. And in the Old Testament, there are repeated stories of failure, repeated indictments of the sheep being scattered and oppressed because of the failure of the shepherd. Jesus is making I am statements 
And the people of his day know exactly what he's claiming. He's claiming to be God. He is identifying himself in ways that the Old Testament talked about God. And the people of his day understood the implications. Jesus knows that is mounting in their minds. So he makes another statement. I and the Father are one. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus makes multiple claims of equality with the Father. If you have ever heard someone say that Jesus never claimed to be God, don't look down on them, but instead engage them in curious conversation because on multiple occasions and in multiple ways, Jesus claims to be one with God. Now that's challenging because of the Old Testament, especially the book of Deuteronomy, which speaks of one God, not multiple gods, and warns that when someone claims to be another God, beware. The Jews were monotheistic. They worship one God. And so this claim would have been confusing to them. But the reality, and you see it as you study John, is that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one in nature, inseparable in their nature, and three in persons. So the one the Jews worshiped as God, he is one in nature with Jesus in the flesh. He and the Father are one. Now Jesus continues his I am statements by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus is the way to eternal life. The way to experience life beyond death is through Jesus. And he says in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not only is Jesus the way to the truth and abundant life, he is actually the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. He's not a way, he's the way. He's not a gate, he is the gate. He makes access to God possible. He's not a truth. He doesn't just say some things that are true. He is the truth. Truth is embodied in the person of Jesus. Now that should have been thought provoking to the religious leaders of his day because they didn't have access to the Father. Their access to God was through the chief priest. And it's thought provoking in our day because some would like you to believe all roads lead to God and all gods are created equal. And Jesus says that is not true. Some want to allow for your truth and my truth, and they can be competing truths. But Jesus says that is not true. I am the truth. His final I am statement in the book of John is I am the true vine in John chapter 15, verse 1. This is another statement that has its roots in the Old Testament. Vine and vineyard language is scattered throughout the Old Testament. In Isaiah, God talks about how Israel was the vineyard that he planted, but they yielded bad fruit. Jesus comes along and says, I am the true vine. He will do perfectly what Israel failed to do. He is the source of life and fruitfulness, and those who are grafted onto him will bear much fruit. These are not the only words of Jesus. These are just a few. In different ways and with different analogies, over and over, Jesus declared himself to be the way to the truth and abundant life. A principle for us to remember in this section is Jesus's words reveal the way to abundant life. Jesus's words reveal the way to abundant life. We start here. 
Because to reject Jesus is more than just to reject a person or an idea or a philosophy. To reject Jesus is to reject the truth. To reject Jesus is to fundamentally reject the source of and access to abundant life. To decide Jesus is not part of life is to miss out on understanding truth in this life. You miss out on satisfaction in this life. You miss out on the good shepherd of this life. In other words, to miss out on that, you miss out on the keys to abundant life. It is to say that you know better about this life and your life than Jesus does. You know what Jesus says about himself. Who do you say that Jesus is? Maybe you aren't sure. I'm so glad you're here, if that's the case. And I would invite you to take the next few weeks out of your life and commit to studying about who Jesus is. It is that important. Maybe you would say, he is the Christ, the promised Messiah, the one true God. Then I would ask, could others examine your life and behavior and words and say they reflect the abundant life that is only found in Christ? Because John wants us to believe and by believing have life in Jesus's name. In the second division, Jesus gives us much to consider in his words, but also in his work. You see, the power of his words is revealed and validated by the power of his works. John chooses seven miracles, seven acts that cannot and do not occur naturally, which John actually calls signs as a way to point us to the truth, the reality of who Jesus is. We'll explore those seven signs in detail this year. The first one is in John chapter two. At a wedding, Jesus commands stewards to fill jars with water and to serve the water. But Jesus supernaturally transforms the water into wine. In John chapter four, Jesus heals an official's son. The official encounters Jesus asking him to come and heal his son. And instead, Jesus says, go and your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. In chapter five, Jesus sees a lame man and asks him, do you want to get well? The man says, I have no one to help me. And Jesus tells him to pick up his mat and walk. In chapter six, Jesus ends up on a mountainside with thousands of folks and commands his disciples to feed them. They're perplexed. But a boy presents his five loaves and two fishes, and Jesus, the bread of life, feeds the 5,000. Again in chapter 6, Jesus sends his disciples out on the Sea of Galilee, and the winds start to blow. And in the midst of the storm, he walks out on the water to the disciples. And lest you think it's some kind of trick, we know from other scripture that he invited Peter to walk on the water with him. In John chapter 9, Jesus encounters a man born blind and gives him his sight. This chapter is profound in that the ones who claim to see cannot see Jesus for who he is. And the one who was born blind can see Jesus for who he is. The final sign is in John chapter 11, where Jesus raises a dead man from the tomb in front of many witnesses by simply saying, Lazarus, come out. Now, we could get caught up in the miracles, but John says, don't look at the miracle. Understand that this miracle you see is a sign. And the purpose of a sign is to communicate information that helps the person looking at the sign 
understand what they are seeing. The first three signs point to Jesus's power to transform death to life, injury to healing, brokenness to wholeness. Isn't that what we all want? They point to the grace of God and that Jesus heals even those who do not ask for healing. They paint a picture of what faith looks like as water is poured to be served and as the official takes Jesus at his word and goes home. And as a man who lived as an invalid for 38 years, picks up his mat and walks. The final four signs point to Christ's ability to strengthen and satisfy in what seems like scarcity, his ability to bring peace in a storm, his ability to give light in our darkness, his ability to make what is dead alive. In this case, John wants us to see that Jesus is not just another man. He isn't just a good guy. He is God in the flesh with command over all creation. And the truth that rises from this section is that Jesus's works validate him as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus's works validate him as the way, the truth, and the life. Who else offers peace in storms? Who else has the answer for death? Where do you go when you're in need? Who or what are you looking to in order to meet your needs, to bring calm in your storm, or life in that dead relationship, or freedom from a sin that enslaves. Even your need to relax or your need for significance or your need for approval. Where do you turn when you have a need? Jesus is and has what you need. And how many of us are looking for our needs to be met anywhere but by Jesus? What is it that you've convinced yourself Jesus can't do? What need will you bring him today? What would it look like to respond to him in faith? We will spend a lot of time unpacking the signs this year. Jesus's words and actions are compelling and they are only part of the story because John also reveals Jesus through the testimony of many witnesses. We will look at that in our third division, men, women, old and young, from Jerusalem and from Samaria. And the witnesses give testimony to who Jesus really is. And what you find is they identify Jesus to be the promised one of the Old Testament. Let's look at some of their testimony. The first witness is John's testimony. The whole book, which starts with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You will take a closer look at these words next week, but you must see that when John decided to talk about Jesus, he started by saying Jesus had no origin. He existed from the beginning. We have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. John the Baptist's words, not to be confused with the author of John, but the one who came as the promised forerunner to the Messiah, he announces Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Only God can take away a sin. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes at night because he is still working through whether he believes or not. He says, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with them. But he needs more to understand. By John chapter 19, Nicodemus will be part of fulfilling the prophecies around Jesus' death. In John chapter 4, a Samaritan woman, she's not a Jew. She has no vested interest in the outcome. But after one conversation with Jesus, 
she recognizes and declares Jesus to be the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. You know, even the religious leaders have this conversation among themselves. They don't really want us to know about it, but Scripture records it for us. They realize Jesus is calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. In John chapter 8, we have Abraham. You see, it isn't just New Testament people who testify to Jesus. Jesus says, Abraham, from Genesis chapter 12, rejoiced at the thought of seeing his day. He saw it and was glad. And the religious leaders go nuts. They say to him, you aren't yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And at this, they picked up stones to stone him. Now, the testimony of the witnesses carries on all the way to the end of the book. It isn't just from one group. It didn't matter your age, life stage, or background. These people who had encounters with Jesus could testify that Jesus was the truth. He was the way, the truth, and the life. He is the promised Messiah. They could testify to a changed life because of Jesus. He wasn't someone who just popped on the scene one day. The words, work, and prophecies of the scripture of their day, the 39 books of the Old Testament, all point to the reality that Jesus is the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, and that's remarkable. And it tells us something about the Bible as much as it does about Jesus. The Bible, the 66 books of scripture, are one story. When we believe the Bible is true and all it claims to be, when we really believe that, we dedicate our lives to consistent study of the word of God because it is the place we can go and encounter God. And when we don't believe it's true in all it claims to be, use it more like Google, checking it from time to time for a specific need or question just to see what it might say. What I hope you see this year is that chapter after chapter, week after week, we are going to encounter Jesus the promised Messiah, either through his words or his actions or through the testimony of others. We are presented with the reality that Jesus is the way to the truth and abundant life. So remember this truth. Believing Jesus is the Son of God will change your life. Believing Jesus is the Son of God will change your life. As you listen to my voice, I don't know what you really believe about Jesus. Some of you would say, I have heard people say, but I am not sure what I believe. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard about Jesus. Or maybe you would say you believe. This year, we will read the accounts of people's journey to belief in Jesus. They're filled with questions, with doubts, with people who are hopeless, marginalized, lives filled with mistakes. But through their encounter with Jesus, they come to see him as the way, the truth, and the life. This year, we will study the book of John. In the first chapter of John, Jesus extends the invitation I want to extend to you. The invitation Philip extended to Nathaniel. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Come and see this year. You might just find that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the source of and supplier of everything that you are and have been looking for.